Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior. Amen. A portion of God's Word for our focus this morning is recorded in the book of Psalms. Psalm 119, verses 65 through 72. I invite you to follow along as we look at these verses. They are printed in your service folder. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 65. Do good to your servant according to your word, O Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I believe in your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling but I delight in your law. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus Christ, our gracious Lord and Savior, your fellow children of God. So we begin today, I'd like you to draw up a list of five things that you consider good. Now you can put that list, list together in your head if you want or write it on your bulletin or maybe another piece of paper, but uh, come up with a list of five things that you consider good. I'll give you one minute, go. Ten seconds. Okay, time's up. Now what I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you and share your list with them. Again, you have one minute. Go. Ten seconds. And time's up. All right, so I'm curious. In your list of good things, how many of you put family or friends? Okay. How many of you put your dog or your cat? A few of you. How many of you put ice cream? How many of you put watching the Cubs clinch the NL Central and uh, now they're going to be in the playoffs? Anyone? Okay. How many of you put experiencing sadness, suffering, or loss? Yeah, it wasn't on my list either. At least not before I started writing this sermon. But based on what uh, the author says here in Psalm 118, maybe, maybe I should reconsider. In fact, maybe we all should. Now, granted, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to the point where I actually want my life saturated with testing and trials of all different kinds. But at the same time, I do recognize that there have been times in my life when my life was filled with sadness or sorrow or loss. And I'm, I'm sure you've experienced the same. 
thing is, God can use things like that. God can use those trials and troubles and, and difficulties that come into our lives to bring blessing into our lives, to bring good into our lives. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Today, we're going to look at the blessings that God can bring into our lives when our lives are filled with tentatio, with testing. God is good. We know that. Scriptures tell us that. Psalm 100, it says, The Lord is good, and his love endures forever. In the book of James, it states that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Here in verse 68, the author of this psalm says to God, You are good, and what you do is good. So yes, God is good. But here's the problem. Here's the thing that many people struggle with, and maybe you and I struggle with at times too. If God is good, if he really is the giver of every good and perfect gift, then why does he allow bad things to happen to his people? It's an honest question, isn't it? Especially in light of the fact that bad things do happen to God's people. Think of some of the people in the Bible and the trials and troubles that they went through. Think of Job, for example, and all the suffering he experienced. Think of, think of Joseph and all the trials and hardships he experienced when his, his brothers sold him as a slave. He ended up in Potiphar's household as a servant. Think of the children of Israel. They're... 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Or think of David and some of the trials and troubles he experienced, like when he had to flee for his life from King Saul. Or later on in his life, when his own son Absalom re led a rebellion against him. In verse 69, the author talks about arrogant people smearing him with lies. David could relate. That's exactly what Absalom did. Smearing him with lies in order to win over the hearts of the people. King Saul did the same. Even accusing David of being a traitor. Of course, you and I probably don't have to spend a whole lot of time thinking about the trials and difficulties God's people have experienced in the past. Because we've experienced plenty of our own. Back in 2008, you lost your job. You spent years looking for another job. Not just months, years. Your savings account was wiped out. You almost lost your home. Even now, though you are working again, and thank God you are, even now you're still not back to where you were before all of that happened. You've seen your share of testing. You went to the doctor for a routine checkup, and the test came back showing you had cancer. You couldn't believe it. But following the doctor's recommendation, you, you went through surgery. Then you went through chemotherapy and, and radiation. You lost your hair. You lost your appetite. And there was more than one occasion where you wondered how you could go on, where you would find the strength to go on. You've seen your share of testing. Two years ago, you lost your mom. In some ways, it seems like just yesterday. And you miss her so much. Then just last month, your uncle passed. And, you know, you thought you were doing better. You thought you were starting to get to the point where you could move on. And, and his passing just brought all of those, those feelings flooding back again. Along with tears. Lots and lots of tears. You too have seen your share of testing. So why? 
if God is good, why does he allow things like this to happen to his people? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that God is not responsible for evil. God did not make anything bad. God created a perfect world. A place where there were no floods or tornadoes or hurricanes. A place where there were no car accidents. A place where there was no suffering or pain, no sickness, no death. Blaming God for evil and suffering and pain is like blaming Apple because you dropped your iPhone. Or blaming craftsmen because you, you know, hit your thumb with a hammer. You're blaming the wrong person. If you're looking for someone to blame for all the evil in our world, if you're looking for someone to blame for all the suffering and trials that that you've had to go through in your life, the person you need to blame is Satan. He is the source of suffering and pain and evil. He is the one who led the first rebellion against God and was cast out of heaven into hell. He is the one who led... Adam and Eve, to rebel against God and sin. And as a result of their sin, not only did they become sinful and imperfect, their world did as well. So the reason that we experience hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and fires is because of sin. The reason that we experience heartache and loss and sadness is because of sin. The reason that we experience suffering and sickness and death. It's because of sin. Sin and Satan are to blame. And sometimes we are too. See, just like Adam and Eve, sometimes we listen to the devil's lies and we rebel against God and sin. And as a result of our sins, we bring all kinds of trouble and and suffering and pain into our lives. Because of the lies that we told our teacher about our homework, we failed science. We got an F, and now we're ineligible. Because of the lies that we told at work, we lost our job. Because... We were going a little bit too fast, actually going a lot a bit too fast, just ignoring the speed limit. We ended up in an accident and, as a result, ended up in the hospital. Because we abused drugs or alcohol, we not only lost our job, we lost our family. We brought all kinds of pain and heartache and sadness into our lives. So sometimes the cause for the sufferings and trials that we go through in life is is because of us. But here's the thing. God can still use things like that. He can use things like that to to bring about good in our lives. That's the, the truth that the psalmist is trying to impress on us here in these verses. That's the important lesson that he wants us to learn. God can use trials and suffering to bring good into our lives. One way that God can use trials and suffering is to help us develop perseverance. James talks about that in his first letter. He writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance is the ability to hang in there. Perseverance is the ability to persist, even when you face challenges or trials. Back when I was a freshman in high school, I went out for football. After the first week, I was ready to quit. We had three practices a day. It was mid-August, 90 degrees every day. I was hot. I was tired. I was so sore I could hardly even walk. And I was ready to quit. But my parents said I couldn't. 
They said, that, you know, if I didn't want to go out for football next year, fine, but I had to stick it out that year. So I did. And amazingly, I did survive. And along the way, I probably learned a little perseverance. God doesn't want me to quit either. He doesn't want me to throw in the towel and give up my, my faith in Jesus Christ. So every now and then, he, he allows a little trial or, or suffering or hardship to come into my lives. And then it, when he does, then he also, through his word, strengthens my faith and helps me to develop a little perseverance. Another way that God uses trials and suffering for good is to draw people back to him. Take another look at verse 67. There the author of this psalm says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. The author is making a little confession, isn't he? He's admitting the fact that for a while... He went astray. He, he wandered away from his Lord. But then affliction came into his life. Then he went through a time of trial and testing, and, and he came back to the Lord. And now he doesn't wander anymore. Have you ever heard the story of the sheep with the broken leg? It seems a man who was traveling over in Syria became acquainted with a shepherd. Every morning he noticed that a shepherd took food to a sheep that had a broken leg. Curious, he, he asked the shepherd how the sheep, sheep's leg had been broken. I broke it, the shepherd replied. You broke it, the man re responded, uh, somewhat surprised. What happened? Yes, I broke it, the shepherd repeated. You see, Billy was one of those sheep who liked to wander off on his own. Instead of staying with the flock and staying close to me, he, he liked to wander off his own and, he, and get himself into all kinds of troubles and problems from which I would have to rescue him. So, one day after he fell into a pit and I had to rescue him again, I broke his leg. Now he doesn't wander anymore. I knew a young man in Minnesota who also had a tendency to wander from his Lord. He liked to party with his friends and have a good time, and as time went along, I would see him less and less in church. Then one day, he ended up in a car accident that nearly claimed his life. He spent two weeks in the hospital, and then another two weeks in the nursing home going through rehab. But God used that trial and suffering in his life to bring him back. After he got out of the nursing home, he came to church regularly again. Has the Lord, our shepherd, had to do the same with you? Another way that God uses trials and trouble to bring good into our lives is to lead us to, to trust and lean on him and his word. You see, that when things are going along smoothly in our lives, when... You know, our health is good, and, you know, job is doing great, and our family's fine, and our favorite sports team is winning. We feel no need for God. We're satisfied with ourselves. We're satisfied with life. We feel we can handle things just fine on our own. But then when we end up on our, our backs in a hospital bed, when uh, our company goes under or we lose our job, when um, our daughter is failing in school or maybe our son gets busted at a party using drugs, then suddenly we aren't so invincible. Then suddenly we feel our, our weakness and our mortality. Then suddenly we realize that we can't handle things on our own. We need someone to help us, someone to guide us, someone to comfort us, someone to give us strength. We need the Lord. It is those trials and those troubles that drive us to our knees in prayer. 
It is those trials and those troubles that lead us to, to pray to God and pour out our hearts to God like never before. It's those trials and those troubles that lead us to cling to God's Word and His promises like never before. Those promises of God's Word take on so much meaning, bring us so much comfort, bring us so much peace. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God is my refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Yes, we knew those promises. We had heard them countless times before. But now, because of what we went through, those words are more precious to us than anything. With the psalmist, we can say, the law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. final way that God can use trials in our lives is to lead us to cling to Jesus, our Savior. See, I don't know about you, but when I've gone through times of trial and trouble in my life, I, I haven't always handled it very well. Times I question God, question His love, question His goodness, question if He knew what He was doing times I even became angry at God and said things that I'd be embarrassed to repeat. But Jesus didn't. Whenever Jesus went through trials and troubles in his life, he never doubted. He never questioned God. Never questioned his goodness. Never questioned his love. Never questioned what he, if he knew what he was doing. Never doubted God. Never become, became angry at God. Whether it was the, the tempting that he went through at the hands of the devil or the persecution or opposition that he experienced from the Jewish leaders or even the, the testing that he went through in the Garden of Gethsemane or the suffering that he endured on Calvary's cross, Jesus never failed. Each and every time he always looked to God's word for comfort and peace and strength. He always trusted that God would be with him, that God would help him, that God would deliver him. He never failed. He did that for you and me. He's our Savior. And for all the times we did fail, all the times that we doubted and questioned and became angry at God, He gave his life so that we might be forgiven. So that we might have peace. So that we might have salvation. Cling to him, friends. Look to Jesus, your Savior, and cling to him with all your heart. He will be with you in every time of trouble and testing and, and suffering. He will give you the peace, the, the strength, the wisdom, the guidance, whatever, it need, whatever you need. He will not fail you. He will be there as your refuge and strength to help you in every time of trouble. Cling to Him. That is the good of tentatio. That is the, the good that God can bring in, into our lives through trials and testing in our lives. That is what led the psalmist to say and what can lead us to say as well. It was good 
for me to be afflicted. Amen.